Wow, here we are again. It's Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. So proud to be with you today. We are in the third excerpt in Psalm 119. Remember now that these are written in uh, sections. And this is like verse 17 through verse 24. And what he said, Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wonders, things out of your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul breaks for the longing that it has unto your judgments all times. You have rebuked the proud who I cursed which do err from your commandments. Remove from me the reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but your servant did meditate in your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselor. Wow. Let's go back to verse 17 and uh, deal bountifully with it. The reader will find that the first four verses of this stanza express the activity of the heart. That's what happens in your heart uh, when you serve God. And uh, toward God, uh, what existed by the study of studying the obedience of God and the Bible, studying what God would have you do and obedience to his word. And the second four verses express, express the contempt and hatred that an obedient person receives from man. And then to explain this verse 18, there are wondrous things in the world. Word. But the eyes must be unveiled in order to see them. To see them, the reader must sit where Mary stood and sat in Bethany. Bethany. Well, let's go over to the New Testament right here and see where Mary did sit in, in, in here, in this uh, verse, in chapter 10 and verse 38. Let's take a look at that. In chapter 10 and 38. Okay. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village. This speaks of Bethany in John 11, and it was a suburb of Jerusalem. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. Sitting at Jesus' feet is a safe refuge from assault upon the authority and inspiration of the scriptures. But Martha was cumbered about by much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do not you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Martha fully realized that Jesus was Jehovah. She never would have spoken so plainly. But she had realized that she was speaking not only to the Son of God, but she was speaking to Jehovah himself sitting there. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, uh, you are careful and troubled and cared about by many things. And uh, what he was saying here to her is she was uh, not pitying love. She was not concerning things which were important, but not the most important. Yes, it's important to serve, but it's more important to serve spiritually. But one thing is needful proclaimed to us in the mind of God and tells us where all victory is. And Mary had chosen uh, that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. The greatest thing in his commandments is to listen to him. Follow his word. Get him into your heart. 
And so that was the important thing. So Jesus said what Mary did was more important than being cumbered about by the things of the world. We need to be careful we don't get cumbered about by the things of the world. Now listen to this. Open thine eyes and I may behold wondrous things out of your law. There are wondrous things in the word, but the eyes must <coughs> be unveiled in order to see them. To see them and the render uh, and render must sit where Mary sat at Bethany. We must sit in the word of God. Roger Kipling, my daddy was a, a lover of poetry. Roger Kipling wrote a psalm, a, not a psalm, but he wrote a poem. And this poem fits this scripture for today. And I'm not so sure that Roger Kipling didn't write this poem from this psalm. I would believe that he did. He said, if you, uh, can, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. He said, if you can keep your head while all about you are losing theirs. And blaming it on you. Wow. Can you keep your head while all others are losing theirs and blaming it on you? Wow. And then there's stanza two, he says here. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being led about and don't deal in less, lies or being hated don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise if you can dream and not make dreams your master if you can think and not make thoughts your aim if you can meet the triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken Twisted by uh, connivers to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you give your life to broken, and stop and build them up with uh, worn-out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn and pitch and toss, and lose the. Uh, and lose and start again at your beginning and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew <coughs> to serve your turn long after they are gone. So hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, Hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, a walk with kings, no less common touch, if neither foe nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance, Run yours in the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. You'll be a man if you can do that. Roger Kipling, I believe, got that from this writing right here. It was a sign or a, a, a writing that he wrote that goes right along with true Christian living. Sitting at the feast of Jesus, Mary had no, no concern about anything but listening and hearing and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we need to do. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, open thine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. There are wondrous things in the Word. 
But the eyes must be unveiled in order to see them. To see them, the reader must sit where Mary sit of Bethany. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. This is what the Bible says right here. It said, it makes it a, a lover of strange, a stranger in the world. But it is a satisfying companion for a lonely exile. The Bible lover will find no companionship among those who deny the contents. So anybody that says that book is nonsense. They are not good companions. The only way that you can prove this book is not nonsense is not by talk, but by action. If you live it, if you follow it, if you do what it says, if you walk as close to God as you can walk, you will have persecution. You will have it. And, and so, my soul breaks for the longing that it has under the judgment at all times. This is an expression used of deep passion or intense longing and shows to what extent the psalmist hungered for righteousness. And that in Matthew 5 and 6. Let's see if we can, how quick we can get over there. That's 5 and 10. Let's see about 5 and 6. 5 and verse 6. And 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst, intense desire after righteousness. God's righteousness imputed by Christ upon the faith in his finished work. For they shall be filled, but first of all must be truly empty of their self-worth. <laughs> I preacher said just this day in the meeting he said we're worth about 23 cents dead if you burned us and take the pile of ashes and used it for fill or a plaster or something else it's worth about 23 cents so therefore we're not worth a whole lot our self worth is not worth a whole lot but what is worth something is to follow what this scripture says and what you will leave behind you in the scripture and whatever. It's not going to be what kind of money, how much money you leave behind. It's not going to be how much <coughs> of all the worldly stuff you leave behind. It's going to be what do you leave behind spiritually? Are you going to leave a reputation behind like Mary had? that she sat at the feet of Jesus and he gave her what he had. He gave her the Holy Spirit and the rest and peace in her heart and life that she could be the person that she turned out to be. He said, I'm a stranger in the earth. Hide not your commandments for me. The Bible makes a lover a stranger in this world. But it is a steadfast companion for the lonely exile. The Bible lover will find no companionship among those who deny its contents. My soul breaks for the longing that it has under your judgment at all times. This is an expression used of deep passion or intense longing and shows to what extent the psalmist hungered for righteousness. Matthew 5 and 6. Uh, it was funny. Not funny, but it's the way God does it. Uh, he had me open up to chapter 5 with one flick just a few minutes ago. And here we are again, opening up to Matthew chapter 5 again, a second time. The same way. And the Lord makes it be that way. And it's chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger 
and thirst. That means to have an intense desire. An intense desire after righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness are the words of God imputed by Christ under faith in his finished work, what he finished. For they shall be filled. Wow. But first of all, must be truly empty of self-worth. We must be truly empty of self-worth, what we think we're worth, in order to do that. You have rebuked the proud who are crushed which do err from your commandments. Those who are too proud to subject their wills to the teaching of the scripture bring a curse and not a blessing upon themselves and become the bitter persecutors of those who make the scriptures their delight. How many times you go to school and you get a degree and people come up and ask you a foolish off-the-wall question because they found out you got a degree. I got news for you. That degree did not teach me how to answer foolish questions. <laughs> it only gave me the ability to answer questions that were pertinent to what the Bible says and not foolish questions. Let's get back in the book. My soul breaketh for the longing that has under your judgments at all time. This is an expression used in deep passion, intense longing, and shows us what extent the psalmist hungered for righteousness. You say, Brother Peter, that's the third time and this excerpt that you read the same verse. Well, it's not my doing. God wanted me to do that so that you'd get it. Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? The Bible makes a lover a stranger in the world, but it is a satisfying companion for the lonely exile. The Bible lover will find no companionship among those who deny its content. If anybody walks in my house and they're not saved people, they're going to turn around and going to walk right out. I don't have much of a problem thinking that anybody's going to come in my house and steal anything. If they do, it's going to have to be a Christian book. I can, I can stand right here where I am behind this podium at this little chapel in my own house here and I can look out there right now and I can see over 30, 35 books. Look over here on the table and there's another 15. Look on this table in front of me and think there's another 8 or 10. So I, I've got 50 to 75 with what books I've got down there. And what books I've got over here, I've probably got 125, 30 books in this one, one area. And if you go upstairs, I've got my library. And my library's probably got six, 700 in it. And so, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in a Bible study. And I'm a believer in taking books that expound the Bible and tell you what the Bible is. And if you're not going to study it, you're not going to know it. And you're surely not going to have it spiritually if you don't study it properly. My soul breaks for the longing that your judgments want. You have a brute of proud who are crushed, which do err from your commandments. Those who are too proud to subject their wills to the teaching of the scriptures bring a curse and not a blessing upon themselves and become the better, bitter persecutors of those who make the scriptures their delight. I will not read that one more time on this excerpt. I had to have it. I had to have it myself. 
Do you know when you're preaching, when you're teaching, when you're studying, you've read over this, you've done a little marking in it, you put some marks around to find places, it begins to come to you after a while. If you read it enough times, you'll begin to see it. And I'm beginning to see what I already saw, then I begin to see better what I saw. I didn't see it all the way. But now that I've seen it all the way, it's different than what it was when I first saw it. So, how did you see it all the way, Brother Peter? By reading it four, five, six times, the same verse over and over and over again. Remove from me the reproach and the word contempt. I found out a little bit something about contempt. Contempt of court can get you as many years in the jailhouse as you would have got for the crime. If you don't go to court, and you don't go to court, and you don't go to court, they're going to start coming hunting you. And they're going to find you. You may have been in Georgia, you might be in Texas now, but they're going to come get you. As soon as they find you, they're going to send a man out there to get you and you're going to pay the fine. You're going to pay that several thousand dollars for that man to come out there and bring you back. And you're going to pay it plus interest. But you think you don't have to go to court over even little bitty things. My boy was in Texas. He didn't have, he had little bitty things against him. They dropped all the cases. But he got time because he didn't come to court. And he got a big fine. He's got to pay. It'll take him the rest of his life to get out from under it just because he didn't go to court over three little bitty things that really didn't amount to a hill of beans in the sense of the word. And so, that's the way the system works. The system's not fair today for people. But that's beside the point. The point is, as God said, if my boy had been using what I'm using, he wouldn't have been in that situation. Even though I can't. I can't say too much. I'm a preacher and an evangelist, and I've been stopped. I got stopped right over here the other day. I got stopped tonight coming home from church. Said I had a headlight out, and my, ta and my tag light wasn't working. It was a very, very nice young man that stopped me and talked to me. I shook his hand and told him, I appreciate you. I appreciate you being nice. I've been stopped by some that aren't nice. And most of them in that little town I come through, every time you come through it, you can get stopped, and they're not nice. They, they think that they're muscular, they're, they're King Farouk, and they're the, they, they want to challenge you, see if they can get a rise out of you. And so, but this young man was very nice. I shook his hand and told him, gave him a try. The sense of this verse is for lovers of the Bible, not to allow reproach, and contempt to the wicked his love for the Word of God. If you love the Word of God, it'll show up. I get up in the morning, many mornings, two to three o'clock, get my tracks in my pocket, run down over here to the interstate, drive down the interstate about five, six miles, get off at a truck stop, and pass out tracks. Well, when I leave the house at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30, if there happens to be a police, especially if he's a new one, he's going to pull me over. Well, that gives me a chance to witness to him. It also gives me a chance to see that we have problems in our police department today with training men to be uh, courteous, especially to an elder man, which they're not courteous today to anybody. They're not courteous to a 77-year-old man. They're not courteous to a young person. They're just not taught to be courteous. And because they're not, it's a shame, but that's the truth. And uh, princes also did sit and speak against me, but your servant did meditate in your statutes. I try not to let those police stopping me bother me. It does bother me in a way, but in another way it shouldn't. 
they, if they was just doing their job and they were polite about it, it would be okay. I had a state patrolman give me a ticket for having my telephone up to my ear. I wasn't even on a main highway. I came out of a private drive and went in a private drive. And as I was crossing, he was sitting at the red light and he gave me a $50 ticket saying that the next one would be $250. And after that, $500, and then you go to jail. And they take your phone away from you. So you can't use your phone in the state of Georgia while you're sitting behind the wheel. But that wasn't right for that man to give me that $50 ticket. I had not read anywhere, or had I heard or seen, since I don't watch television, I don't listen to the news. All I do is I study Bible, I go to church, and I do Bible work, and I don't listen to the things of the world. And so therefore, it wasn't proper for him to give me a ticket. It wasn't proper anyway, because I, I was crossing the highway, that was all. So anyway, that's beside the point. The point is, is if you're going to follow God, the devil's going to send everybody after him, especially the policeman is going to come after you. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but your servant did meditate in your statutes. Now those policemen are princes, and they're going to speak against us. And most policemen are not saved people today, and that's just a shame, because if I was a policeman, I'd want to be saved. You do stand a better chance of getting shot and killed if you're a policeman than you do if you're not. And so I would definitely want to be following the statutes of the Lord. All these passages speak of Christ as our example. <coughs> the mightiest in Israel spoke against Christ, but his solace was your statutes. Your testimonies also made delight in my counsels. It says, What a rebuke to a worldly church that seeks the counsel of men from a man-made philosophy with its man-made answer. The Word of God alone should be our counselor. And the Word of God alone should be our counselor. Listen, forgive me for talking about the police there and for getting it off on a tantrum. That's just one of the ways the devil works. He works that way. He, he, he irks you around and makes things irk you and makes things that shouldn't be be so that you would be uh, drawn aside and not be able to stick to what you're supposed to stick to. And uh, we need to pray for our policemen. They, they have a tough job. And they're not trained right. They're trained... Uh, uh, like uh, they're in the service, and they're in the army, and they're out there uh, capturing uh, bad forces. And that's not necessarily the truth. A man that's got his tail light out or headlight out should not be approached like a criminal. And uh, the testimonies also are my delight and my counsel. What a rebuke! A worldly church that seeks the counsel of men. I see those. I'm not in one. I'm in a church that seeks the counsel of the Lord and not one that seeks the counsel of men. Nor do we follow the philosophy of many men that say, if you have your church and you're in this denomination, you've got to follow it. Now, so that's why we're independent and we don't follow that. There's a church right down the street that my daughter and my granddaughter, uh, daughter-in-law, clean their bathrooms. A worldly church have just got a new preacher, a worldly preacher. And, and they're not interested in godly stuff. They're just interested in running their program the way they run their program. And so that's it. And that's in the church. Your testimony also are my delight and my counselors Hey, what a rebuke this is on the worldly church that seek counsel from men, that have man-made philosophies with its man-made answers. And the Word of God alone should be our counselors. If the Word of God is not your counselor, you don't have a good counselor.
The Word of God has got to be your counselor if you want a good counselor. Well, our time's come and gone. We'll see you next time. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Bye-bye.